I'm enjoying the show. First of all, I didn't know how much swearing there was. I'm not a big swearer. My parents let me swear when I was a kid, so I couldn't rebel against it. Isn't that clever? <laughs> There's only one word they wouldn't let me say. It's a horrible word, spastic. <laughs> if I said that word, my mum would freak. She even hit me. Would she try to? <laughs> Come on! I've got four more jokes and that's it. Is it fair to say it would be quite funny if someone committed suicide by suffocating themselves with a Marks and Spencer's bag for life? <laughs> Is it fair to say there'll be less litter in this country if blind people were given pointed sticks? <laughs> Is that too far? Any blind people in, I apologise. <laughs> Cheers. Is it fair to say if it wasn't for Comet Relief, Lenny Henry would be starving? <laughs> Finally, is it fair to say if you're watching Channel 5 News and something big happens in the world, you've got to check on BBC One to see if it's true? <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, I actually learned my news from watching this show. I don't really watch the news. It upsets me. All I know about the world is this. East and West don't get on. And I think the only way East and West can get on is if the leaders sit down together and they take turns putting the best bits of their own culture forward, taking the worst bits out and moving on as a team. But that's going to be a very tense meeting. What's the best thing about Islam? Not drinking. What's the best thing about the West? Drinking. <laughs> Let's toss a coin. We don't gamble. That's that one fucked. <laughs> What's the worst thing about Islam? Our women have to cover themselves up. What's the worst thing about the Western world? Half of our women don't cover themselves up enough. <laughs> Listen to this. I propose all women are covered up from birth so even they don't see themselves once till they're 16. So the best looking women are forced to develop their personalities to their potential because they can't go through life going, ah, haven't bought one drink all night. <laughs> Imagine being 16 years old, standing in front of the mirror on your birthday, unwrapping yourself like the biggest present ever, going, please be fit, 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 please be fit. <laughs> Gutted. <laughs> I'll tell you my news, um, I've got two children. I've got a two and a half year old daughter and my wife gave birth to our second little girl exactly three months ago today. Thank you very much, Dean. Thank you, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I'm the happiest man in the world. I spent the whole day with my daughter yesterday. My wife and two year old went out leaving me with a little baby. I'm so nervous in case she's sick or I fall over on her. So I carried her around the house in one arm all day long. Wherever I did, I made sure my daughter was with me, which meant anything I did all day yesterday had to involve me only using one arm which was a constant reminder how I could have avoided this situation in the first place. <laughs> Isn't it a miracle? All of us here are made by people. Two people can make a person. How cool is that? And get this, one of them makes milk to feed the person. <laughs> yes! Your milk. <laughs> my daughter only has to suck on my wife's nipple and she gets dinner. Which is ironic, because when we first met, I used to buy her dinner on the off chance. <laughs> Cheers. I read a women's magazine that said because women put on weight during pregnancy, it's important to take your wedding ring off. So I did. <laughs> I got, I've got to say one thing. About two days ago, I made my newborn baby laugh out loud for the first time ever. And it felt amazing because it was new material. <laughs> We've got two children. If we're going to have a third, we've agreed we're going to adopt. That's a good thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. But if I adopted a child, it would have to be from Africa, India or China. I could never adopt a white child. Because if he grows up to be thick, I don't want anyone thinking he's mine. <laughs> Fuck off, that was funny and you know it. Now, well, so I went, listen to this, I went to a farm the other day with a vegetarian friend of mine. You know when you go around a farm, look at the animals in the farm, there's often one animal you don't quite recognise. I wish I'd tipped the farmer 20 quid, so that when my vegetarian friend goes, what's that one called? He goes, that, that's a tofu. <laughs> here tonight who eat corn but believe it's wrong to eat meat can I point out to you people for that corn to taste like meat someone who'd eaten meat before had to come along and taste the corn to verify that it tasted like real meat <laughs> therefore an animal died in the making of your dinner tonight you self-righteous pricks <laughs> I'm sure that's a good point I think I met the thickest bloke I've ever met you know when you meet someone who's so thick you're not quite sure if you're allowed to take the piss you go, what are you a... Oh, he is. Sorry. <laughs> he had a front tooth missing. Do we all agree the thickest person you've ever met has got a front tooth missing? <laughs> you know, 
be staring at someone's gap in their teeth. You can't concentrate, can't you? It's like when someone's got a hairy mole and you're asking directions. <laughs> and you can't listen to a word they're saying, because all you're seeing is that hairy mole, right? <laughs> you're staring at it like this. <laughs> and I don't like comedy stereotypes, but that's not a comedy stereotype. You don't hear about front tooth missing jokes, do you? I hate stereotypes. My dad's Jewish. I'm sick of Jewish stereotypes. Stereotypes are based on gross generalizations, aren't they? I've seen Jewish people being generous. <laughs> From that reaction, I'm guessing you haven't. <laughs> I've seen black people who can't dance. <laughs> and I've seen loads of women who are very good at parking. <laughs> Admittedly, this was all in the same circus. <laughs> I went to my Arabic barber and I had a wet shave today for the show. I tried to look my best for you and um, it, 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 it's, it's, I, I love having a wet shave, but it's quite tense. You've got an Arab, <laughs> a Jew, <laughs> and a blade. <laughs> And the news on in the background. <laughs> but it's also quite tense to my barbers because my barber doesn't know my name. You know those friendships you have like with a milkman when you swap names on the first day and then you never get their name again. After 10 years, you can't ask someone their name. I know my barber's name, it's on a shop front. Get this for the best barber shop name ever. My barber's called Ali. Ali the barber. <laughs> play a practical joke on Ali. I've decided that the biggest high in life you can possibly get is a cringe. Above falling in love, above seeing your baby being born, when you intentionally embarrass yourself in public and that rush goes through your body, you go, oh, I can't believe I just got my cock out in Sabres. Because <laughs> I've made it more than six items. <laughs> but you know that rush? That's a great feeling, but you can't enjoy that feeling because society's told you it's not a nice feeling. Next time you cringe, just get into it and enjoy it. It's amazing. I'm going to give Ali the biggest cringe buzz ever. Listen to this idea carefully. You have to use your imaginations. If you haven't got one, pretend. <laughs> Next time Ali's shaving me, I'm going to turn around and say, you know what, I've known you for 10 years and I consider you to be my friend, Ali. And he'll say, I consider you to be my friend. My friend. <laughs> And I said, do you know what I do for a living? And they all said, no. I said, I work with profoundly deaf people and mute people. It's my birthday next week. I want you to come to my party. Be me, you, and my seven other best friends in the world who are all mute. Now, let's be honest here. What could be more awkward than going to a birthday party on your own where you don't know the host's name or any of his mates and they're all mute? <laughs> I'll tell you, when they bring on my birthday cake and you've got to sing happy birthday <laughs> to a bloke whose name you don't know with seven mute people. I'm glad you're laughing, because that is the end of that bit. <laughs> then what you're seeing tonight is a freak show. This is a cerebral freak show. We are dysfunctional people entertaining normal people. Are your parents still together? Yeah, well, mine aren't. It's your fault. <laughs> my parents got divorced when I was four years old. This is true. My mum wrote me and my sister up in the middle of the night, so we're running away from home. Your father's asleep. He knows nothing about this. Take your favourite thing you like playing with, and we're going. But I was clever. I took my dad. <laughs> I've also got some advice for all the single men in the room, who, or maybe the men who are at the beginning of a new relationship and have not had sex yet with your new partner. This is my advice. When you have sex for the first time with your new partner, whatever you do, do not put your whole cock in. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> that you hold back a full inch for the first six months. You, young lady, have no idea how much willpower it would take a man to know that there's an inch that he's not using, a full inch that you can't use for six months. Little tip, get some luminous paint and draw a line across it. <laughs> Even two lines close together, so when the first line disappears, you know to stop. <laughs> and after three months, when she says, this is over, it's more a say, give me one more chance, give me one more night, baby. You take to a favourite restaurant, you have a limousine outside, a favourite champagne in the fridge at home, a favourite CD in the player. You have a meal, then a the limo, then the champagne, then the CD, then you fuck up for the last time. But this time, you put your whole cock in, and I can guarantee you, you will save that relationship, thus showing how shallow you women really are. <laughs> there is only one slight problem with that theory, and that's my idea of holding back an inch and me not putting my cock in at all. <laughs> Some people say that pornography objectifies women. Surely it humanises objects. We live in a society that's crumbling. Politeness is disappearing. When you're the generation that has the chance to change these people. I was at a massive supermarket. I was at the back of a queue, and the bloke at the front was paying for loads of things, and he realised he'd forgotten one item. And this is how he dealt with it. He put his bags down, 
He sighed as if he was the only person in the world being put out by it, and he walked to the back of the shop at this speed to go and get it. This was my natural reaction. <laughs> I got that shake when you realise you're being wronged. There's nothing worse than being wronged, is it? Apart from meant it's someone who you love who's being wronged. I've been with my wife for nine years. I've reached the stage now, I can't even listen to her problems anymore, her stories. She'll come home from work, she'll oh my God, that new girl was so rude to me. I'll just, just tell me the end of this story now, I can't cope. Because <laughs> you'll sit through a 10 minute sad bit, then it turns out it wasn't that sad, so you suffer for nothing. So last night I got raped. It was all a dream. <laughs> Put the word dream in the beginning of your say. In fact, don't even describe your dream, because dreams are boring. I got a friend who go, man, had a weird dream. I was a giraffe. I was a flying giraffe. I could fly upside down and breathe underwater at the same time. And my grandmother's face and blue hair. And my thoughts came out in bubbles in Morse code. And the fish could all read my mind in Morse code. And I didn't realise this. I really offended one fish, because I thought it was really ugly. It turned out to be a woman fish. <laughs> yeah, and you switch off, don't you? And that is why there's still so much racism in the world today. Because 50 odd years ago, Martin Luther King came out and he said, I have a dream! And 200,000 people went, oh, fuck off, mate. <laughs> so, so, back to my story. I'm trembling like this, he goes away and gets his thing, and this is where I think anger starts. It's about expectation. I decided how sorry he had to be. I wrote in my mind the minimum apology I was prepared to accept from that man. Then when you've got your minimum apology, you start to write the hypothetical rant that you'd like to say if they don't meet your minimum apology, which is very dangerous, because by the third edit, you've got the whole script memorised, they come back, you're pissed off with an altar cue in front of you, and it's no wonder the words go, it's like, I can't type fast, but when I'm complaining, my fingers can go like that. It's like I'm so pissed off, I want to ruin their life as early as possible. <laughs> and then the friend looks over your shoulder and goes, you're not going to send that, are you? No, I'm not going to send it, I'll edit it down. But you don't, you have a double espresso and go, fuck it, boom. <laughs> sad when you think how short life is that all over the world right this second there are millions of people going like this because one person in their situation didn't have the decency to just apologize i genuinely believe that sorry is the single most powerful word in our language next to maybe blowjob and abracadabra <laughs> it goes blowjob abracadabra and then sorry which i've often been known to say back to back <laughs> thank you so my message is, whether you believe in God or whether you don't believe in God, it doesn't matter. Be a good person. That's obvious, isn't it? Be a good person. And I do believe in God. And I'd like to meet God to tell him why I've sometimes doubted him. And it's not tsunamis, it's not illnesses. The reason I doubt God's existence is because all seven billion people on this planet, without exception, poo. <laughs> why would God make a poo? He made a rainbow, then an apple, then a butterfly, then a big fat poo. Does that make sense to you? We have to procreate. For us to procreate, we have to find each other attractive. I'm a heterosexual man. When I look at a heterosexual woman, or a lesbian if she's made an effort, right? <laughs> I'm only joking, sisters. All women are beautiful. If you look at anyone, you get to know them in their eyes, nose, hair, breasts, nipples, belly buns, those two dimples on the back. What are those dimples for? I think if you touch them at the same time, you get electric shock. Um, <laughs> Thumbs, thighs, calves, feet, not many feet. Do you know what feet are? Feet are where God got bored drawing us. God went... Boing. Oh, sod it. <laughs> but apart from feet, why would God spend months making the most incredible thing in the universe, a woman, the creator of life, and think it's not ready, there's something missing, and I can't put my finger on it? I've got it, I get a big poo and stick it bang in the middle. There's 300 people here, half of you are women. I can see you look fantastic, you really do. But when I think about the fact you've all got a big poo inside you, <laughs> I'm actually appalled you had the nerve to come out tonight. <laughs> Thank you. That is why I'd like to meet God. And I'd say, hello, God, I'm Adam. <laughs> Not that one. <laughs> Listen, God, I've always, wanted, I've always wanted to meet you. I'm a big fan of your work, <laughs> particularly the early stuff. <laughs> but I've got one question, God, just to get inside your mind. The mind of God, one question, what's with the poo? What's with the poo, God? But God might turn around and go, no, you got me all wrong. Got me all wrong. You rub it in your face, makes you fly. <laughs> Half of you laugh, and the rest are going, I'm going to try that when I get home. <laughs> My name's Adam Bloom. Thank you so much. Let's see you again. Bye-bye. Thank you.